So delighted now to be joined by Mars Brosnan and Kieran Gizzy McGrath to look ahead to Galway versus Mayo in the Allianz Football League round one this weekend. Um, it's hard to believe we're saying that already this early in the season. But before I do that, uh, just some personal news. Uh, we're delighted to announce that the Backdoor GA podcast for 2023 is now brought to you by Steve Motor Group for your personalised vehicle shopping experience. Find out more at stevemotorgroup.ie and make sure to check them out uh, for some top quality cars. But to get in, I suppose now, to the action of Go and Mayo this weekend. But before we do that, it feels like we can't start anywhere else. Just to, I suppose, mention, I suppose, everything that's happened between Kid McCode and Glenn um, over the weekend. Gizzy, I've seen you were uh, replying to a tweet there uh, during the week. Just to, do you feel a lot of this onus is on the Kid McCode Crokes management team? Uh, to be honest, it's probably a lot of what is down to the refereeing. I mean, look, it's it is flawed. The, the way subs come in and out is flawed. Uh, and the referee should have probably just held the game until he knew that the sub had gone off. And then if it's a case that Glenn uh, took the 45 early, then comments and stopped playing and take it again. But uh, I do think, yeah, I think Kim Kun- McCood, the last thing they needed was chaos uh, in that last play and bringing in two subs one after another. It's not, it just, and like, clearly it caused some chaos because now we're talking about replays and objections. So, like, I don't know what benefit. I know Woolley replied that he thought maybe they were getting in defenders for forwards, but uh, one of the one of the players came on was wearing number 10 in his back. So, um. I don't know. I, I, ju- I just think it, it added confusion. If I was on that pitch, I just want to know where I am, mark my man, get the 45 over and out of the way. And this thing of delaying it and bringing in subs, I don't think it suited. It wouldn't suit me if I was playing. And uh, it caused chaos. Do you think we should have a replay now? Uh, when you think when you think about it, really, it, a replay is probably harsh given what happened because the player mightn't have known that he was supposed to go off. But at the end of the day, the last play, they ended up with 16 players on the pitch and one of them was standing on the goal line. So it's not really f- fair on Glenn either. Um, but I do think, unless unless Mullen knew what he was doing and was trying to play cute, I don't know if he did. Only he knows that. And... Uh, but it's a it's a referee and it's a referee and error definitely, and I suppose it's open for Glenn to object and to be foolish not to and have a second crack at it because it's not easy to get there. It's a long road. It's hard to get there. It's even harder to get back. So uh, more luck to them if they object and win it and get a replay. Mars, you've been speaking about it as well on like off the ball throughout the week. It's it's just I suppose crazy when you consider. I suppose Kim McCord have been out celebrating this week with Andy Merrigan with all their supporters. Um, and now there's, I suppose, this case, like, there's a lot of word going around that we could have a replay Saturday week, but obviously we're a long, long way away from a decision with the CCC to Kim McCord object and what happens after this. Yeah, I don't know if we will have a replay on Saturday week because Kim McCord have three days to appeal. So that brings us up to Saturday. If they do dissent to appeal the objection, then there's a hearing within the next three days. So you're talking about, what, like, are they really, if we could get it then three days from Saturday, you're talking about Tuesday, Wednesday, are they really going to announce next Wednesday that we're going to have a game on, on Saturday and Sunday? I, I'd be surprised, to be honest. I don't know. I think the only thing anyone's going to agree on here, Paul, is that this is just a mess. Like, they've, they've absolutely messed up. I, 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 you know, as you mentioned, I've been speaking about it a bit this week. My personal opinion is that I just think, like, both clubs have been failed by, by officiating, by the GA actually to be honest like I don't think the onus should be on Glenn to come out and appeal this I, I think we really need to grasp them otherwise you've got I've seen some people are blaming Glenn for, for lodging an appeal people are blaming Ken McCord for not doing more maybe offering a replay I think th- this this stuff is just we needed what should have happened like there's precedence here what should have happened obviously is that the 45 was retaken um, that's what Conor Lane did in 2021 when t- the last kick, but Henley's last kick against Dublin, that, uh, that yeah. was because there were 16 players on the field that day. Stephen Cohen was supposed to come up. That was a Mayo player as well, by the way. Um, and he just stopped it, let him retake it. That's what should have happened. Um, so on a, that was an officiating error. You could see he actually had his hand up at the time. Paul Manning was still leaving the field as well. So like, like, if you want to get tactical, there were 17 players on the field. He just sort of stopped it. And you can add on the time then at the end if you want. But uh, yeah, he didn't. We've 
left with this mess we're in now from a leadership perspective nobody seems to want to be the grass and it'll people are, will cherry pick whatever they want you know there's precedence on both sides Navin O'Mahley's played Dunboyne obviously in 2005 Robbie Brennan's club uh, they brought on an extra sub he actually didn't even touch the ball at an extra time but they appealed it Dunboyne were offered initially a replay and they said no and instead they were given a walkover so on the other side then Kim McQuid played Nafina in the final or Cross McGlenn in the final in 2007 and All-Ireland final uh, Cross McGlenn had a man sent off for two yellows he didn't go off and Kim McQuid never appealed that so if you want to, you can cherry pick precedents on both sides. I think it's, I think it's a shame. I, it's, a, it's a total mess. Like from every perspective, it's a mess from plan and training. You've lads in the beer for three days now, and suddenly they're being called back in. Sounds like Kim Good met yesterday. They're keeping their counsel on what they're going to do. Um, are both those clubs supposed to go back training without having a replay confirmed? How? Do, what does this mean for for Rory Gallagher, for Port Joyce with Shane Walsh, like trying to manage all your players who are still potentially caught up in a, in a club? I mean, it's a total and utter a mess from from every perspective. I would love to see. A bit of leadership on this, like I really do think, if there's one, if one critic, criticism I'd have of the GA in 2022 is that I thought they were too quiet around messing in the crowd, around the abuse referees talk. Like you, you, we should see, I think they should come up and make a stand. Like it's, I think it's part Duffy was good at doing this. Like he'd really come out and if there was a big controversy in the GA, he'd make their position known and give a bit of leadership. And I just think it's just it's a shame that once again, it looks like it's been left up to the clubs, the managers, everybody else to try and navigate this without any sort of solution. But yeah, I don't think, the only thing I think any of us are going to agree on here, Paul, is that it's a total and utter mess. Like this is, it's a, it's a disaster every which way from the intercounty game for the club game, for the GA as a whole, I think PR wise, it looks, it just looks bad. Yeah, I really think though, Myers, the commentary around Kim McGood has been, I suppose, everyone references Shane Walsh's transfer, the money they have in the club and all this. I think maybe that probably has been a step too far and, I don't think people in Kilmacud will be quite happy with the commentary around them because, like, all of this is, you, you can say it's an official's decision that should have been made. Like, I don't think a lot of the extra stuff that's been mentioned about Kilmacud is maybe a bit too harsh. I agree with you, yeah, 100%. I think, I, like, whether you want to admit that or not, I know people, some people are getting put out of joint and they're saying they would. Like, personally, I do think a lot of the commentary, whether you like it or not, is being coloured by the, the Shane Walsh transfer. Like, people are sore about that and now it looks like they're on the the end of a, a favourable decision and that's definitely colouring a lot of it like that, that's there's no doubt about that um, I know I spoke to you about the Shane Walsh situation before like I, I think a lot of that is overblown to be honest it's just the timing of it and everything else he's a victim of circumstances more than nothing else but yeah I do I, I 100% agree with you I, they're entitled to feel out of joint about this Glenn are obviously entitled to feel out of joint about this um, I do, and, and again Paul that's, like, that's what happens in a vacuum like I do I do you know, it's easy for me to say, and I know like sometimes people kind of get angry at journalists for saying people should talk more and that kind of stuff. But the reason I think that we, we should hear more from management maybe at times or from the GA in this situation is because otherwise there's a vacuum, like there's a void. And in that, lads, you know yourselves, like people will fill that whatever they want. Like you'll hear different accusations, you'll hear rumours, you'll hear all sorts of soft talk. That stuff happens when there's there's nothing else going on. So if you can, if you can put people right, I think there's no harm in that. I, that's not it's not the fault of either clubs really in this situation. I don't I, I disagree with anybody kind of paying from one side or the other. Like I just I think this is it's a total and utter mess. And we've been they've been both clubs I think would be entitled to feel like they've been failed by the by the GA really by not kind of grasping this nettle and at least like at least resolving it within a week of the game. Like, like the fact that we we could be I could be sitting here talking to you next week and we still don't know what we're doing this week is just a farce. Yeah, this could really just go on and on and it's it's impossible to know when we'll have this game as we say in Saturday week's mentioned but as Morris mentions there uh, still looks like we're not going to have a decision maybe until mid next week um, but we're not going to I suppose fully focus on that because I feel there's been enough commentary and enough people probably giving opinions on it during the week Gizzy is it divided loyalties for you now this weekend um, no. <clears throat> Gary Moore uh, not for me. Maybe, maybe for my kids. The uh, uh, I see them going around the house there wearing my old tops and stuff. So I had to buy some Galway gear, bring it into the house. But no, um, I'm a I'm a, a Galway man still at heart. So no divide, no the divide in loyalty there. What's it like seeing Mayo gear around the house? Yeah, t- it took a while to get used to, but um, I heard I heard from Mio, so I still have some old Mio gear knocking around anyway, so uh, I can't say too much. And are you going again for Gary Moore this year? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give it a. We started back uh, during the week, so uh, new manager and um, had a conversation with him at the start of the year. So he was anxious that I play again. So I said I'd try. Get no one know though. Great stuff. Another year, another year, and yeah. Uh, going Mayo, the uh, uh, main event, like Morris was saying there just before we kicked off, like it's it's hard to believe that this has come around already, but like. What a game to start the league Saturday night under lights in Castle Bear. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Sorry, Morris. Yeah, go on. Well, I, I just I think lads that the the the, the fixture you would define Paul Joyce's reign by is Mayo. Like I do, I, I think if you go back to the very start, uh, like post COVID, I think the the downturn they started very brightly. The downturn started that day in June when Mayo absolutely wiped them. Uh, in in twenty twenty, you go to twenty twenty one, that kind of final. When they had them on the ropes at half time and you know turned them over in the second half. Uh that was like a, I think that was a defining game for Galway. I think we all know like there was a lot of hard conversations post that game. That winter was was tough for, for a lot of for management, I'd say, for players, for everybody. And what made them last year was getting over the line in the, the first day of the championship. I, I think that was really the the bounce that they needed. You could see how much that meant to the Joyce in the sideline. So I think this is a, a defining game. I know it's 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 it is only the league and all that sort of talk will go on, but uh, one man who puts a lot of stock in the league is is Park Joyce because he went gung ho to win it last year. Um, I do think that Mayo are going to come, come off a bounce. I do think that from a performance perspective from players, again, like this is very important. I was just talking to Kieran off air. Like I, I think you look go back to there's league games where you, that day in twenty twenty, Paul, when Mayo wiped them, there's players who never play for Galway again. Like a post that like that game, that was a league game. You know, you can say whatever you want about it, but there's players who were taken off at halftime that day and did not play for for Galway again. Um, there's guys who just came back to bounce back from that. John Maher, but that was his only game for, for Galway so far was, was that day in 2020. I think it's a great story that he came back, strung together a bit of club form last year and uh, is now knocking on the door again. Like, But I, I do think there's there's a lot more weighing on this particular game, both because of the rivalry, because of what it means to, to Joyce, because of what's gone before, then if they started against any other team in Division 1, really. Just on this, like, um, Bars mentions there, Gizzy, like, a defining game and you'd have to say like if you look at Dublin when they were going well like any chance they had to beat a carrier Mayo when they're in their pomp and even if it was only the league they wanted to do it to issue a statement for further in the year like for Galway it's I suppose they've lost them in the FBD and for this group they'll they want to issue a statement to I suppose issue out to Mayo that they're going to be here again this year yeah, and for like from a spectator's point of view, sure, it's 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 a great game to get. Uh, there'll be a buzz around Galway, buzz around Mayo. It's Saturday night under lights, and uh, but I think from a management point of view, for both sides, it's probably not the ideal fixture to get this time of year because, like, I think Galway to beat Mayo will probably have to be at full throttle. They're missing a couple of guys. PJ doesn't like to to lose, and he definitely doesn't like to lose to Mayo. So. They're going to have to go down there and tear into it. Mayo, the same way, they're under new management. They'd prefer to try things and try different things and ease their way into it. But now they can't. They're, they probably can't afford to do that against uh, Galway. They probably have to go out and make a statement uh, and, and go as strong as they can with their lineup. So I would say from PJ's point of view, he would have been happier. The more he avoids Mayo, the better because he. And no disrespect to Ross Common or Sligo or Leeson, but Connacht usually comes down to Mayo and Galway, uh, and I think both teams will want to want to hold their cards close to their chest before that championship game comes around. But uh, unfortunately, if they want to win this league game, they'll have to go strong, and especially Galway. Um, I think they mightn't have the strength and depth. Uh, Kieran Malloy is a loss. Liam Sink is going to be a loss, and if if they're down two or three more, like Paul Conroy probably hasn't uh, much played in the last few months or stuff. So they could be down a couple of players and it's probably not ideal for them to be playing Mayo this year in the year. Just uh, like you you make some really uh, good points there, even about some of the defenders that are gone, Gizzy, and I suppose that's going to be the most interesting thing this weekend, how Galway uh, make up their defence. But interested to get your views. Uh, we're not officially sure how many my column players are available, but it looks like more than likely, it's probably going to be about seven to eight. 
like you have all these campaigns with Kerfin and you would have seen all the Kerfin guys go back in with Galway and it can often be a harder transition than people think. But like even for some of these my Cullen players this weekend, like you think back to I suppose nearly the three Kellys last year, they've been playing since last January when Galway won the FPD in 2022, haven't got much of a break. But then you're saying go or down bodies. Like, do you expect them to be thrown back in this weekend, or do they need an extended break? Yeah, you see, that's 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 back to my point. Where ideally, uh, PJ will rest these guys. Would rest, uh, especially the Kelly, especially Sean Kelly. He's a big player for Galway. It does no doubt that he's the main man now. But um, he probably needs time off, and PJ would probably like to give him time off, and no more than Shane Walsh probably time off, but. He doesn't like to lose, uh, and especially to Mayo. So he's probably going to need these guys. I don't know if we have the players to replace. The fact that the, the guys I mentioned previously are out, can he afford to also leave Sean Kelly, uh, Peter Cook, if he's back in, uh, even Shane Walsh? I mean, I'm sure he was talking to Shane Walsh during the week. If Shane Walsh makes himself available, if he wants to beat Mayo, he probably has to play them. So, yeah, like, it's it's tough. I think, I think that... A, Players off the back of club season would do well to have two or three weeks off minimum, but can we afford to do it if we want to beat Mayo? Like, that is the thing, Boris. Like, we were even referencing, I remember the last podcast you are on about like the year that I suppose, in particular, that the Kellys have had. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really tricky one to navigate, Paul. And like, like I do think it's worth saying, I think Galway have very good, like, very, very good people in. In this regard, within this setup, like someone like you know Keen McGinn, for example, who be very high, high regards certain conditioning coach, would be very conscious of getting boys a break. But like, to a certain extent, I think management are kind of hamstrung by the calendar. In an ideal sense, it would be. I think you would just let lads off. Like I personally, I, I'd not even let Sigerson lads off. But that's not been. We saw you know a whole host of lads like Sean Fitzgerald, Rob Finley, Matt Turney all play three games in eight days between the first rounds of the Sigerson and the FPD. Uh, that's not going to change. It sounds like Galway had a run out in a, in a friendly against Westmead last weekend and a couple of these boys were, were playing there too. So I think, you know, if by all accounts, Sean Kelly was, was, is going to get his run out, like he, he was playing there. I, I do think, Paul, it's interesting, Paul, you look at it like probably something that hasn't been as much discussion this year, but I do think it's coming, like to a certain extent, I think to the storm coming is what's happening with the uh, the access that certain players are getting uh, into county setups, for example, right? I do think it's interesting. I'm not this. I'm not making any accusations here, but I think it's interesting that if you look at the three uh, Mayo boys with DCU, none of them played the open rounds or season cup. I don't know why. I, I think that's interesting. Tommy Conroy didn't play for for NUIG either. I think that's interesting. Um, Sean Kelly didn't play either game for NUIG. Uh, so you, you've got like proven into county players who weren't involved in Sigurds Cup games, um, whether that was their choice or their management's choice or. You know, Sigerson Cup's choice or whoever whoever made that decision, those boys weren't there. And I do you're trying so you're trying to limit the crossover. And I think if it's come like ideally, if it's coming down to a choice, we'd let lads play Sigerson or their club. But the reality is that we're not seeing that. So you know, Owen Kelly actually had a run out uh, at the end of one of the FPD League games. It sounds like Peter Cook was involved at the weekend too. So if you all these boys are going to be pulled all which ways. The thing that I think is is crucial for Galway, it's interesting, right? Like, you know, not to uh, I'm sure Paul you read the Irish Examiner every single weekend but I'll give it a plug now uh, that this weekend I have a piece for, on, for this game on the just looking ahead to the la- looking back I suppose at the last three years of Joyce's reign and the pairs he's used and how much game time he's gotten into all those pairs and one thing that is striking to me is that so like I you know, put in every single game minutes played on the next century 34 games you can see very clearly who he's reliant on who he isn't who he's using that sort of thing and one thing that's apparent to me is that I don't I think it's gone under the radar that of in this, you look at this Galway team, you've got three players who are in the top 15 in terms of minutes played for the, for the last three years who aren't available this weekend or likely for, for much of the year. So, Cameron Roy, Liam Silk, and Finian O'Loy are all in the top 15 for minutes played. None of them are available. Look at a guy like Johnny Heaney. Johnny Heaney's played 85% of the minutes of under Bar Joyce. Like, that's a phenomenal figure. Like, that's really phenomenal. Second on that is actually Paul Conroy, third is Shane Walsh. He's not going to be involved this weekend. But so, I do think there's, you're missing fairly significant holes there. And a Part of that problem is that two of them are in the defence. And then if you want to throw in, it sounds like Sean Kelly was is, is in the mix, but even if you were, if they were to extend the rest out to him, you're talking about three kind of huge pillars put out, yeah, coming out of the defence. Jack Lynn so, as well, like hasn't played with you. Jack Lynn is, yeah, is, is also carrying a knock too. Yeah. So I think that's, 
Like, and now look, maybe you know some people are telling me that's an opportunity. I would be one bit surprised to see if my own club. I think Sean Fitzgerald will get a run this weekend, for example. I think um, it's uh, Billy Manning could be in the mix as well. Players like that who we haven't seen a lot of. Like, if I if I could show for a boat, I think Daniel Farty actually from Saltill might even be a play as well. But so there's opportunity there as well. But what I what I mean is that right when you look at people look at Mayo and say, oh, they have a huge rebuilding job to do with without Oshin Mullen, without Lee Keegan, uh, these big players. Galway are missed it. Like, there's, that's a lot of minutes to take out of a team. Like, you know, just if you look at uh, I have the list here. Sean Kelly is that Johnny Heaney, Paul Conroy, Shane Walsh, Liam Silk is fourth on that list. That's a huge amount of minutes to come out. You've got Cameron. If you want to actually send it out to 16, just for, to for humor me here for a second, Sean McCurran also comes into that as well. That's another player out of your defense who we're definitely not going to see this weekend. Hopefully, we'll see him soon. But so, what I'm saying is, there's a lot to replace there. This is kind of like I would say this is kind of phase two for this Galway team. There's players now who you know, I think I, I talked about there are 70 players that Joyce has used, but if you look at the FPD League, nine players saw game time for the first time there. So there is kind of a new phase now. You're trying to blow in a couple of new players and hopefully, I think, both to get some arrest into some lads who need it, but also to maybe kick on that. We'll see some of them this weekend. If we just even try and look at the team and what kind of team go, I could line out this weekend. Like, is it coming over to you? Goalkeeper is another interesting one because Conor Gleeson was obviously a goalie last year, but we haven't seen him. I suppose that's probably somewhat to, got to do with Dunmore's run. Then we've seen Bernie Power, we've seen Tygo Malley as well. I believe Dara Fortman was in with the setup. I'm not sure if he's still in there. Um, but like, who, who do you expect to start in goals this weekend? Um, I, I think Bernie. Uh, Bernie played the last FBD League game. Uh, I wasn't at it, but it, a lot of depend on how he went there. But I'd say it's Bernie's at the minute to lose uh, by the sounds of it. So I would expect that Bernie Power would get his chance if he's trained. I hear he's trimmed down, he's trained well. Um, and if he had a decent FBD League campaign, then I think he'll be the number one. But uh, we were saying off there, myself and Morris, like uh, PJ is cutthroat. So you might only get one chance if if you make a mistake or in any of them FBD games, if Bernie has made a mistake, that then uh, PJ will just move on to the next guy. There's no no mercy. Just seem to have lost Morris there. I'm not sure what's happened to him. He might come back in now in the next few minutes. But yeah, your experience of playing with Bernie Power like as a keeper, what, what does he bring to the table? Uh, Bernie, Ber, Bernie's a... Uh, like as a defender, you like to have confidence in the keeper behind you. And I was lucky enough in Currafin with the keepers we had. Um, going back to Dave Morris, Tom Healy, and as a cornerback or fullback, you need a good relationship with your keeper. And in fairness to Bernie, he's solid. You feel confident. He's good under high ball. He's a good shot stopper, and uh, has a brilliant kick out. And it it all comes down to when. Bernie sometimes loses focus um, and more in around at the start of a year, more so than in in-game focus. But if you get Bernie tuned in at the start of the year, you keep him trimmed down uh, and fit, uh, then the, there's no one better in fairness to him. He's a brilliant keeper. So I think if he's at if he's if he's in good shape, if if he's at it, then he'd be my number one. Is it his kick out something? That puts on my head in that regard, do you think? Yeah, uh, Bernie is talented. Like, I've even in Currafin down to the years, he's played outfield in at intermediate level and he doesn't look out of place. Uh, he played a wing back um, and he has a lovely strike with ball, even from his hands. And like, you can be confident to go back with him nowadays. You want your keeper to be able to play a bit, he can play a bit, but his kickouts, uh, like, his kick out against Kilku does often show up on Twitter still where uh, our wing back tucked in and Silky made a run over the top and he just pinged it right into his path. Um, very few keepers could do that. Uh, and Bernie has that, that ability. So, yeah, I think, I think all round, all round kick out, uh, shot stopping uh, and obviously playing skills, Bernie, Bernie will be top of the list. Even there, like when we were touching with Morris on the defence, and you mentioned obviously Liam said Kieran Malloy are significant absentees. Jacqueline hasn't played for UL in the Sigerson, so I imagine he probably 
might just come too soon from this weekend. That's three of your starting defence uh, from the All Ireland left, with, and then I suppose you throw in Dylan McHugh, John Daly, and more than likely you'd. I suppose with them players gone, you would expect Sean Kelly to come back in. Yeah, if 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 what Morris says that he played uh, midweek against Westmead, I can I see why not. Why he, once you commit to something like this, usually. You get your break, you take it for as long as you can, but once you're back, you're back, you're an option. So I presume he'll he'll start. Um and then look at this good guy screen that uh Sweeney from Salt Hill. I expect him maybe to start a wing back. Uh Billy Mannion is really uh improved over the years and, and looks like a real contender that could take Kieran Malloy's spot. Um but you do you do just fear a bit that the lack of a bit of leadership, they're all young, like um like hopefully Sean Kelly will bring leadership. Dylan McHugh is at an age now where I suppose he's a good leader. But uh, back in the day, if you had an injury or one or two injuries, you you still had maybe Gary O'Donnell playing <clears throat> or Finney and Hanley. So if you had Gary O'Donnell there and you brought in a couple of young guys, in fairness, he was a great leader, great communicator, and it was it made the job easier for the younger guys to blend in. You just wonder is that leadership there that if they have to bring in three young guys or three new guys. Does someone take responsibility for them? Because it's not easy. If you're if you're American, Kenny O'Connor, the last thing you want to do is be worried about what everyone else is at. But I I do think at in the heart of defence, they need a leader just to command and take control. And and hopefully Sean Kelly will be back, and he'd be one that would would do that. It's interesting when you touch there, like uh, Rob Carl Sweeney coming in. He was he obviously played a cornerback against Mayo, but. You feel he probably would be more natural, maybe out in the half-back line. You talk about Billy Mannion. He could come into the full-back line. He's played full-back for um, Montpellier Milan in the past. You'd have Sean Kelly there. But just that other corner then, like, who would you expect to come in? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I know Johnny McGrath was, was got a bit of game time in during the FBD and stuff. Right? Is he still in the panel or was he one of the guys that was... He's still in the panel, all right. He picked up a hamstring injury um, for GMIT uh, in the Sigerson. So it's yeah. Pretty- so what you might see, you might see uh, like uh, pushing Johnny Heaney back to wing back and putting Sweeney back in the corner would be an option again. Um, I don't. Know, I know James Foley and a few were were let go. So like it's so it's, it's like Owen Kelly as well. Yeah. yeah, Owen Kelly could get a chance. Um, but if he if he if he put Carl Sweeney there in the FBD, it, it could be something that he might do. He could even put on Kenny into wing back and put Carl back into cornerback. It's it's kind of a, it, I won't say it's a special specialized position, but not everyone wants to play back there, and not everyone is comfortable back there. So it's you you do need a guy that's comfortable to play cornerback. It's not easy for a, a wing back to transition back into the corner. Not everyone can do it. Um so it's it's something that they'll have to get right, and maybe Cahill Sweeney might be the man that goes in there. Yeah, the the, the makeup of midfield is interesting then because um, Paul Conroy didn't play as much in the FBD, um, obviously due to the tragic circumstances of his father passing away. We see Matthew Barrett there, we've seen John Murray there, we've seen Killian McDade, you throw Peter Cook. There's options for this goal in midfield, but it depends how. PJ wants to approach it because with the way the modern game is, you're going to have that kind of third midfielder dropping into the pocket. So I suppose it's interesting to see who he's going to start and have probably to come out to midfield and be able to rotate it because you have someone as well like Matthew Tierney as well to throw into the equation. Yeah. Um, I suppose from the outside looking in, if you're saying what's your strongest midfield, uh, if you want to rest Paul Conroy, obviously Paul Conroy and Killian McDade had a good partnership last year. Peter Cook been back, you'd be saying Peter Cook and uh, Killian McDade maybe with Paul Conroy to come off the bench. But I suppose if PJ really wants to see where John Maher is, where he's at, uh, or Matthew Barrett, this is the game. So I, I, I would expect John Maher maybe to get game time there at midfield see what he's about uh, and um, that'll be the test for him. Yeah, that, that's the thing about it here, like throwing someone in at the deep end, like he probably wants to go as strong as you want, but it's a really good point that if you do bring John Mary in, 
you you find out where players are at this stage. And I suppose it's, it's it's what the league is at in some some ways, but it's, it's not going to do too much around the team either. Yeah, I think with PJ, he that's what he likes to do. He likes to test you, see where you're at. So there'll be no excuses from if he plays John Maher in it. If he plays John Maher at midfield, there'll be no excuses from John. He'll either be able to play it or he won't. Same with whatever way he goes in the full back line. Uh, if it's Cahill Sweeney or Sean Fitzpatrick or whoever it is, if that's your job. And unfortunately, I'd say if you go back to PJ and say that that doesn't suit me, I'd prefer to play somewhere else. You could be told where to go. So, um, yeah, if they get game time, it'll be a test. And it's up to them to pass it. Just again, uh, a massive thank you to our sponsor, Steve Mortgage of Clare Galway. Uh, for all your vehicles and sourcing and inquiries, find out more at stevemortgage.ie. Uh, big thank you to them for coming on board as a sponsor for 2023. I suppose we have been running through the team a bit, but it's just so interesting, Gizzy, because there's that excitement around supporters to see how Galway, I suppose, do line out and... The point as well is how they react of getting to the All Ireland final because we all seen the claps last year with Tyrone. They didn't start the league well. They made a sluggish start to the season, and they were catching up from minute one. Uh yeah, it's 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 hard to know. I think PJ will keep lads grounded. I think that's the good thing. Uh, I know they say that that the best players don't always make the best managers, but the fact that PJ has been there and done that and has the has the medals. I think it's 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 very hard for some players to come back. Maybe, maybe that if they have their all star in their back pocket, or whatever, maybe that they come back with a bit of a lax attitude and say to PJ that uh, I want to take two or three weeks off, or I want to do this or that. I, you'd be a brave man, I think, regardless of what you have to walk into a dressing room and tell PJ that you're not at it, that you need a few weeks off. So I think that will that will ground them. Um, so I think lads will be slow not to not to uh, look to get off to a good start the next day, to be fair. Just on the the forward line, Matthew Tierney and Johnny Heaney were obviously there last year. We haven't seen a lot of Patrick Kelly. Maybe he does return uh, this weekend. Then you throw in your Damien Comer, Robert Finnerty's. With Mayo, though, it's the one thing... They do probably need in that forward line this weekend, like you're talking there, if you move Johnny Heaney back. You do need that bit of balance because with, with all the Mayo team, there might be a bit of a change of style, but there's still the main thing what Mayo are going to want to do this weekend is is run it from the back because that's ultimately their game plan. Yeah. Um, just looking at the FBD League final, they seem to come away from that a bit. They seem to be going a bit more defensive maybe Roch has brought back some uh, ideas from Donegal or his time in Donegal but um, yeah you could you could see Peter Cook come into that half forward line that'll be a good test for him uh, I think look there's no doubt that the loss of Lee Keegan and the loss of, for his leadership loan and Oshie Mullen is a big loss and O'Hara uh, gone this weekend as well yeah is he injured yeah he, he won't be fit this weekend at all yeah, Paddy Durkin didn't play that FPD league game. He like if he's not available, he's a loss. Um so and th- there'll be a lot of young guys uh thrown into the mix. There's Rory Bricken and um Sam Canlan and a few that wouldn't have the same experience. So it'll be their first night out. And it's a tough ask for them because if there's ten or twelve thousand down in McHale Park and it's been televised and all that, it's added pressure for these young guys. Um and you might you might have a young guy that's expected to mark Damien Comer. I do hope, from a spectator's point of view, that uh, I know Mayo are going to want to try stuff and they're probably going to try and implement more defensive game plan and go usually go defensive as well. It'd be nice if it was just you now an ideal world might not happen, but it'd be just nice if two teams went at it uh, and and just went out and played football and I know that's probably not going to happen that's a in the modern game that's a, a bit of a stretch to ask but it'd be nice to see it from a spectator's point of view where there's a bit of entertainment I think we're all hoping for that the thing is here it's their second time meeting they could meet in the Connacht Championship they could meet in the all Ireland Series again so we could have three or four uh, Galway Mayo meetings but that's why it'd be so important for either team to try and 
get one over on uh, each other uh, this weekend. Do you expect to see any surprises in the forward line? Maybe see a bolter that we, we haven't seen this year, Anthony? Uh, from a goal point of view, I don't... I. I don't think so. I think uh, I think he'll go with the strongest fifteen. I obviously if Ian Burke is available, I I'd, I'd expect Ian Burke to start a corner forward. Um, could Desi could Desi come back into it? I don't know. Um, Do you have to just with with Ian Burke obviously play with him? Does there need to be more of a balance there if Ian Burke plays with Robert Finner TV? Because ultimately they're not two players you want to be tracking back, you want to keep doing as close. So do you think then if, if those two play that go and need then to probably, I suppose, have a bit more of a balanced approach around the half-forward line then? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, was it, was it Kevin Walsh's last year where Ian Buck seemed to drop out nearly to the 11 position and uh, hold that shape you're talking about? But um, yeah, I think in the modern game, you do what's required and in an ideal world, they'll keep bodies up, but you'd be expected to track your man. So the likes of Ian Burke and Robert Trinity, they're going to find themselves back in their own defence, uh, tracking and marking and that kind of stuff. And then it's it's about transition as quickly as possible to get back up the pitch. But Ian, Ian Burke's greatest asset is that his ball winning ability and his ability to lay it off, uh, what makes him. So ideally, you keep him close to goal. He's so tricky. Uh, and he loves to bring players into the game that it's close to goal, you need him, not out from goal, but look, needs most. He'll have to come out at some stage if he does play. Morris, we've been kind of running through what's the potential lineup this weekend from players we've seen throughout the FBD. We have you back now, we just lost your connection there. But do you expect to see any surprises? Obviously, just when we lost you, we were, we were talking about facts, but around that midfield forward area like there's we, we, as we were saying with the midfield there's a lot of players that can play from half forward line to midfield then with the forwards we're kind of looking at a lot of it and a lot of those forwards ultimately do kind of pick themselves they probably do yeah I think um, I actually think matchups are going to be crucial for this weekend um, so some of that will be dictated by what Mayo do like for example I don't know if you remember that game in 2021 the kind of final um, 26 minutes in, Sean Kelly came up. To my mind, that's what changed that game. Sean Kelly got a hamstring injury, came off uh, before half time. And, um, like, you know, not to put a two final points in it, but he ran Aidan O'Shea ragged. Aidan O'Shea started in full forward that day. By all accounts, you know, might do something similar this weekend. If they do, I wouldn't be one bit surprised to see a similar matchup and him try and do the same again. Um, and if, I know, Paul, you've been talking a lot about Robert Finney maybe out in the 45. Uh, if that does happen, I think we'll see Match Attorney in midfield. Just to dictate that, um, you probably don't get, you know, by all accounts, Tomo Conan is absolutely flying, but you don't get Tomo and Ian Burke into the same team. I just don't see that happening. Um, they're kind of two similar players, uh, as Karen spelled out there. Like you, the two of them want to be close to goal. It's actually their skill set is best suited to that. But can you really afford to count? Right, if they want to against Easterly, I don't know how he is. Uh, uh, yeah, I, th- I think yeah, I think he's okay. Yeah, I think um, I think he's he's by all accounts he's. He'll be, yeah, he'll be okay, I think. Um, I think there's a couple, like, there's a couple of knocks that are going to be factored into it. I think maybe Sean Kelly might have took up a small bit of anger against me at the weekend, but, um, so stuff like that, maybe that will, will factor into it. I wouldn't expect it really, to be honest, but I do think, you'll probably, you'll probably see Damon Palmer and Ian Burke in closer to goal. I think whatever they may all do at six is going to be really interesting. There's, you know, uh, Kim might be able to speak more about this, but if, if Conor Loftus, for example, is going to go at six, does that mean Paddy Durkin, this idea that Paddy Durkin is going to be at 11 to drop back and cover for him? Uh, I see huge opportunity there for John Daly. Um, as you know, Paul, I led the Van Wagen for him last year. Uh, I'm a massive fan. I actually do think he's, the, his kick passing ability is such now that you kind of have to account for him. Like you can't let him stand up the field and pick passes because if he does, he'll do what he did in the Ireland final last year, which was, I think he had five assists in, a, in an Ireland final. So I more so than... Availability is one factor, but I actually do think matchups are the other thing as well. Is that how are how are they, each team going to match up like that? If Mayo you know, do go with this, you know, whoever it be it, maybe Sam Callan or McHugh, a wing back, they'll take mine then. So that that'll be an interesting one as well in terms of this this force that lets them dig up from that. I think this will be a really cagey game. That's I think this like there'll be long stretches of this where you see fifteen men behind the ball. I just think it'll be dictated by the play. Maybe K 
Kevin says that a lot of talk about wanting to kick the ball more. I don't necessarily know if we'll see a huge amount of evidence of that so soon this weekend. So, but yeah, for, I think we'll probably see Sean Kelly. I think John Daly. Um, I think Matthew Taney will line out in midfield. I'm surprised to see Paul Connery. Um, I think Damien Cameron uh, in full forward in as well. That you can read your spine. And then in and around that, I think Billy Mannion has a chance. I think Daniel Farty has a chance. Sean Fitzgerald definitely has a chance. Uh, it's probably probable, actually, we we'll see a lot of them. Uh, Johnny Haney, as we spelled out, is Mr. Arrival. So he's played, actually, he's one of the very few players who's played in every single line for Galway as well, from the full back line right up until he's actually has worn 15 as well for Galway. So uh, the versatility that he offers there is, is a huge plus. And I actually do think, speaking of the, the damage imitation, trying to fill that gap that has been left by Silke and Malloy, uh, Haney is tailor made to slot in a wing back there, and you wouldn't blink at that uh, transition. And it also opens up a gap for. As you mentioned, if we're going to try and plug somebody else into that, if a Rob is going to be at 11, you're trying to shuffle the cards in the deck there and see who's going to fly in at that wing forward spot. So it opens spot there as well. We just, we just, yeah, that's some of that I would see shaking out. We're just kind of losing you there now, Morris. Um, I don't know if can you hear me, but just Gizzy, last year when Galway played Mayo. David McHugh and Kieran Malloy sat back in the pocket and going and he played this double sweeper system, which ultimately frustrated the life out of Mayo. It's new management that with Mayo. There, there's talks about a change of style. Do you think Galway nearly kind of will go with that kind of approach again to try and, I suppose, maybe get Mayo, try and force them to run it at pace or try and force them to kick it with maybe like two wing forwards going into the half back line and then the two wing backs sitting like they did last year. Yeah, it's it's hard to know because do you if you're poor at choice, do you do you still go that way and try and perfect it even better again? Um especially when you have to bring in two potentially two new lads to slot into that style of play. Um or do you do you hold back and work on that down the line or working that in training and then don't give uh, me a bit of video on well okay let's, this is how to set up the last time we played them it didn't work how we played so this is how we're going to play now um, and Ross should be very good at that uh, he'd be very good at analysing opposition and figuring out a way of of how to break it down uh, and back to Morris's point about John Daly I'd be surprised if Roch allows John Daly that room and space even in a league game, I'd be surprised if he doesn't go after him uh, and and have a man earmark to to pick up John Daly. Even if it's not who John Daly's marking, it might mean a corner forward might drop out and pick him up from open play, which is I I think you'll see something like that. Um, and I just think I just think from a goal point of view, they can play that way. Uh, I think try something different. Maybe just go out and have a have a rattle at it, uh, because it. We know that system works them, but I, I just feel if you go out and, and play that way again and play one way, then Mayo eventually will will master how to beat it and then you're in trouble. So I think Galway can play that way. They showed that last year. So I think they need to just just see, can they come up with something different to plan B and be able to revert back to the main plan again down the line um, if they want. But they probably just need to try something different and next Saturday night might be the night to implement it. You've been mentioning Stephen Rochford there, uh, Gizzy. You obviously worked with him under uh, Kerr Finn when he ultimately got you over the line against Schlock Neal in 2015. He's back now at Mayo um, in a different role this time as the coach. Um, so I'm not sure is he the exact coach now because they all seem to have different designated roles of this Mayo management uh, lineup. Assistant. Uh, assistant. Assistant manager, I think, is, yes. is his title. But uh, your experience is working under him. Like so many players have talked so positively about him, whether it's Tony Gall, whether it's Kerr Finn, whether it's, it's some of the Mayo players in the past. Uh, ah, yeah, Roch, Roch is good. I mean, it was exactly what Kerr Finn needed at the time when he came in. He was young, ambitious, uh, organized, and like even like he just had us uh, in 2015, he had us at our peak, really, didn't he? That uh, I know then under. What last? What when he left? What stayed? Brought us on to another level again. But I think the groundwork was done in his time. Um, 
now not only by him but obviously the guys around him Kevin O'Brien Dave Morris them guys um, Joe Kenny Mike Comer uh, they all had an impact and that carried on after he left but I just think this role with Mayo might suit him because uh, the Mayo supporters I hope not too many Mayo people listen to this podcast so hopefully but they're <laughs> you know they're they're uh, they're fickle enough and they look to blame they don't like to blame the players they like to blame management but uh, so it, there'd be a bit of pressure on him to perform I think with uh, Kevin McStay being manager that takes the pressure off him he can go and do what he does best and that's concentrate on the football side of things and Roch has a good football brain um, and he is a good coach and I'd expect I'd expect that what we see on Saturday won't be the f- whole won't be the full picture of what we can expect from Mio either. We might see snippets, but I think come Rot will have one eye on championship and honest, one eye on Galway, and he'll he'll be already analysing the way Galway played last year and looking to counteract that. Yeah, and even going from that FPD game, Mars, Mayo started with an inside line that night of Paul Towie, James Kerr. Aiden Norm. Now, it was in the Dome, so that's one thing you have to take into factor. It was played a lot quicker there that night than probably it's going to be played this weekend. But if you look at what Mayo scored uh, that night against Goy, they scored 218, but one thing they always tried to do was, I suppose, get that ball in quicker to the full forward line than maybe we've seen in the past. Now, do Towie, Kerr, Kerr and Orm start in together? That's another interesting thing, but like they scored 211 out of 218, and then there's Ryan O'Donoghue and Killian O'Connor then played the next night, uh, in the FBD League final. So, uh, it's hard to know who, who Mayo are going to put inside. Yeah, uh, another factor in that actually, Paul, is that Mayo played a challenge game earlier that day yeah. against Westmead with um, with the bulk of our main liners out there, right? That, that seemed to be a, a if there's not for post. That team will be close to the team we'll see this weekend than the other team. So I there's a bit of element of shadow boxing in that. I like I do think it'll be interesting to see. Uh I, I think we all to be honest, I think they're gonna go gung ho for this game because they don't you don't so I, I don't think many teams this year, because of the nature of the calendar and you've only got a week for, for some teams for a championship if you get into a league final. Some teams don't want to make a league final. We, I Mayo had no interest in being in a league final last year. Uh, I wouldn't be one bit surprised if it's something similar this year. At the same time, you don't want to go down because of the jeopardy that comes with being in Division two. So there's an element to that. And I think Mayo's they start starting at home, but then I think they'll play Kerry and Tyrone and their their first two games after that, which is a tough run of it. Whereas I think Galway have Ross Common the week after. So you probably at Tyrone at the at home in tune the week after that again. So you know if you're looking for from a Galway perspective, you would be saying you take two out of three wins there, maybe this is the less likely one to win. Just another factor in that as well, Paul, is that uh like if you look at it just from a comparative perspective, the first media night that we had with McStay Rochford um, Liam wasn't there but Damian Mulligan was there was in we were called to Castle Bar on the 13th of no, September 13th of September and that was when they handed out that sheet that this assistant manager role that Tony Buckley's role all listed out all the roles that were listed out and I think it was announced that night that Neil Fitzpatrick so they had, they had the work they had groundwork done by that this is September now and they had a lot of groundwork done they sat down with a lot of players at that stage um, you look at from a Galway perspective right the first media briefing we had with Joyce was the 29th of November in Loch Ray, the night they announced the Supermax sponsorship. And they're only back a week. Joyce was still in conversation with some players about when he was going to get access to them. Um, that was when, at the time, he was talked about, it was the night he confirmed that Ian Burke was back, that the, the other eight lads that were in as well was then. So Mayo have a good bit more done because of the nature of when you're allowed to return because Galway are in the final. Mayo will have a good bit more done. You would expect to see evidence of that. This weekend, like you would have the first round of the league, especially. Do you expect Mayo um, to hold advantage, hold a bit of an I, advantage this again? I think so. There has, to, yeah, like from a load management perspective and from what you've banked, there, there, there has to be an element of that. You add in on top of that the fact that you have three Galway clubs involved in uh, the club terms are right until the business end of that. Uh, like Mayo had their all their interests were out long before that. They had access to all these players. Um, Mayo don't have the same difficulty, both from a club and apparently from a from a signature perspective. Be very interesting to see the amount of players that played this weekend and who actually was then set, announced in Sigurdsson squads and did they actually play? Did they get any? Did they play see any games? And that'll be interesting. Um, like the match attorney and Rob Finnerty and Sean Fitzgerald all did play Sigurdsson, but will we see something similar in MEO, for example? 
like Jack Carney, I'd say Jack Carney I played this weekend. It's, I, it's curious to me that he hasn't played any stickers in football. He's definitely good enough. Um, so situation like that would be, be interesting. But I, I think, the, given the amount of work done, they have more work done. They're at home. Uh, McStay wants to start with a bang. I think there's there's more on the line, really, from a Mayo perspective too. So at this stage, they're probably for a slight step ahead in terms of what they've done as well. I think they, they have a upper hand in that regard, yeah. Would you agree, Gizzy? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Morris is spot on there, yeah. And I would expect, I would expect to Mayo to win it. Um, and that's back to my original point that if Galway are to be probably competitive, they need to have everybody and they need to be yeah. at it. And that's not easy given that they've only started back a few weeks and lads were coming in and out of club games and all the rest of it. So Mayo have that advantage and I do expect Mayo to win it. Um, and if Galway earned uh, 100%, then it's going to be hard to see how they can beat a Mayo team now that's probably uh, that step that few weeks if not months uh, down the road ahead of ahead of Galway but PJ doesn't like to lose <laughs> that that is the main thing and uh, like Morris they talked there about I suppose the West Mead game Mayo played and then they played the Galway uh, the same day in the dome but it was more so an experimental side but do you expect to see the experience lads maybe with like your Sam Callans and Rory Brickettons and those type of players, but would you expect to see your Killian O'Connors, Jeremy O'Connors, Paddy Durkins, all these players thrown back in? To a certain extent, yeah. I, well, I, I'd be curious to see, like, do we see any... Like, I do, to be honest, I do kind of hope that, uh, like, not from a, from a goal perspective, but just for a Gaelic football perspective, if we could be objective here for a second, I do hope we see a slight evolution in from Horan Ball. Like, th- there's a certain mix-up. And if that's the case... Um, and maybe you've talked about this already with Karen, but like, or maybe you could do it now. But like, like where, where is Aidan O'Shea going to play this weekend if he starts? I think that's a very interesting question. If Paddy Darkman plays, where is he going to play? Um, if we see them at 11 14, I think that's the good thing for Gaelic football because they're clearly trying to shake things up. If we see the likes of McHugh, Callanan, I think that's personally for Gaelic football's perspective, I think that's a good thing. Like, I think it's, it'd be a good thing to get minutes into those players to see how they, they're moving. Um, may also have announced a captain, which is another curious thing to me. Like, I, I, I you know, is Stephen Gorman going to carry that out or will it be my example? Small stuff like that. So there's, I I think, Paul, if you go back to Gaelic football in every single year, right, the All-Ireland champions, they set a trend. Like that's, winners set trends where it's a copycat league, coaching particularly. So, you know, and this is this is a historic thing. You go back to when Donny Gall started playing the blanket defence, everybody tried to copy that. When Karen Donaghy won on Ireland for Kerry into full forward, you saw Michael Cusack and Ona Gara and every other team was trying to put in big men on the edge of the square. So you look at Kerry last year, like what is the trend? What's what teams learn from what Kerry did last year? And to my mind, I think teams are going to look at Kerry, and it's not actually it's not about a revolution. It's kind of it's just it's an evolution. Like Kerry didn't they didn't spin up turn up the wheel. Like they they got a more set structure defensively. Got um, morally established as a six. I think a lot of players kind of came around to the idea that like if you can't do, you know, maybe some players are trying to swing for the stars, and instead it's like if you can't do great things, if you can't be a David Kiffer, just do simple things in a great way. So Stephen O'Brien to me is a classic example of that. Stephen O'Brien didn't win an All Star, but are you telling me within that dressing room they weren't lauding him for his block on Johnny Heaney when he dived on his boot in the first half of that Ireland final? Like of course they are. So it's small stuff like that. So from a, from both of these teams' perspective, there's an onus on them to take a new step. So you can talk about establishing them if you want, but I personally do hope we see like a to a certain extent a bit of experimentation. Like let's see what like give Ian Barker a start now, for example. Let's see if he can add something to what was a fairly sparse forward line last year. Uh, on the other side of the field, like if if McStay is as big a fan as we think he is of O'Shea at the edge of the square, let's see it. Like let's try it and see if if that stuff works. I kind of hope that both of these teams doesn't don't put short term game above all else. Do you know what I mean? Like I do t- hope that we see elements of that, and plus on top of all that, it'll make it a, a more entertaining game too. Yeah, no, Gizzy, that's something we were touching on. Uh, like it started to show that like we're hoping for, I suppose maybe. And a more attack minded game than I, I, we're expecting really this weekend. But at the same time, it's like the amount of times these sides could face you, you, you could see it turning KG as well. Um, well, yeah, because like we're talking about <clears throat> PJ not wanting to lose and and me open uh, a bit further on and all the rest of it, but whatever about winning or losing, uh, 
either team won't want to take uh, a hammering. So either team won't want to lose by six or seven points. Um, I don't think Mio will lose by six or seven. I think potentially if Galway are in that, they could because Mer- Mio might have no mercy. Um, so that's the danger. So that's what maybe Galway might say, well, hold on a minute. We just need to go defensive here. Let's make sure we don't start the year off by getting a, a 10 point trimming to um, Mayo and leave that pitch wide open and leave some of their inexperienced players to get her to get um, a roasting or whatever it may be. But I think if Aidan O'Shea plays, he has to play at 11 and pick up John Daly. I think if they if they if they risk him at the edge of the square, Morris, back to your point from a few years ago, I think Sean Kelly, if he's full back. Yeah. He'll run him. He'll run him right. He won't be able for him. Um, but I think John Daly would suit him because uh, John is more comes into the game or play late and is is more a conductor. And it might just suit Aidan O'Shea just to pick him up in that role. And to be fair to Aidan O'Shea, he's very good in the tackle, so it could be an opportunity to turn over John Daly. Uh, but I think I think with the guys Aidan O'Shea, it could be it playing him at full forward. Could be a liability of Sean Kelly. We all know the ability Sean Kelly has getting forward. And then at midfield, I know he was abroad and stuff. Has he the legs from midfield? Uh, could he get outran there as well? So I think if if there's a position for him, it's probably to pick up John Daly at centre forward. Where would you expect to see him, Mars? I, that's actually it's a good point. It's probably not something I, I took into consideration is the has he the load in the legs either for for, for that battle and I do think as well if, if this game does turn cagey runners from deep are going to be crucial and that's when they, they will put stock in and stop in someone like Kelly or on the flip side stop in some whoever we see from Mayo's calling card for a long time has been that kind of punching power from deep so trying to, to put strackles on them and that's why maybe you know I, I kind of could see Johnny Heaney starting further up the field even though I do think he'll end up at wing back this year for Galway but purely because he has the legs to track um Anyone, basically anyone really from that, that back line. So yeah, I think 11 would be a fancy matchup. I, I also like, I th- it depends. I actually think it does depend on what Mayo do at six. Um, if you go back last year when Mayo played Kerry in Chile, I was down at that. It was to, like, in terms of whether that was, that could rival Langley, like it was an absolute flood of a day. And uh, Aiden Shea was playing at six. I don't know if you remember that day against Kerry. I think the whole point was that Centre forward, they're dropping off, and he so he may not necessarily would have to do a man marking job. He kind of has that, like he's a great tackler, he'll cover the space, he's a kick out option, all that kind of thing. I could see the logic to it. I don't think that's an option anymore because a lot of teams now are starting more dangerous forwards at 11 to try and take advantage of your dropping off sixes. So the counterbalance to what we saw last year is if there's a Morley starting at six, John Daly isn't actually as bad for it, but players who tend to want to drop off and cover their full back line. The eleven will go and punish them. That's the we saw this actually happen in Ireland as well. Probably uh, a step ahead there, where you you'd start someone like Finnerty who is give, if he's given that leeway could really take advantage of 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 that kind of space. Um, now the other thing as well is that you go back to the Roscommon League final last year. I think I think I learned a lot that day, but I also think like certain players. I just remember sitting in Crow Park that day and watching Sean Fitzgerald marking Connor Cox and sixty yards of space in front of him. And we will not see that. Like you, you, we, I think that day in particular kind of showed Gollard that they need to have a better system. It wasn't always John Daly dropping off. Oftentimes it was actually uh, Dylan McHugh who did kind of, they'd give me it so that he could be end up being the free man. And, uh, uh, he's so physical and he covers the ground so well that he was a very good presence there. So that's a, another option on both sides, actually. But yeah, I think from a Mayo perspective, Aidan O'Shea and John Daly is probably the, the most desired matchup. So that's a good call, yeah. Yeah, no, like it's there's some really fascinating, um, I suppose, plots and twists to take with this game. Uh, it the game takes place on Saturday evening in McHale Park, half seven, um, live on RT and um, across the different various uh, local radio stations. Uh, just a big thank you again to our sponsor, Steve Mall Group, Claire Goy. Uh, they supply a wide variety of new and used vehicles. Steve on Steve Motor Group. Taking the work out of car shopping, and a massive thank you uh, to Kieran McGrath and Morris Brosnan for coming on. And here's hoping uh, Galway can upset the odds uh, this weekend. Cheers, Paul.